On the afternoon of Friday, February the 25th, 2022, five experienced divers prepared to perform routine pipeline maintenance along the Trinidad and Tobago West Central Coast. All five men were employed by contractor LMCS Limited, but the pipeline belonged to the government-owned Paria Trading Company. The four-man repair team consisted of Fazal Koban, Rishi Nagasar, Yusuf Henry, and Kazim Ali Jr., the son of LMCS's owner. The last man, Christopher Boudram, was the designated rescue diver. His job was to monitor the men as they worked, to make sure the safety procedures were followed, and to respond if anything went wrong. In that day, something did go wrong, horribly wrong, leading to one of the most claustrophobic disasters I've ever covered. This is the infamous story of the Paria Pipeline disaster. That day, they were scheduled to work on the riser at berth 6. Though the 30-inch pipeline wasn't in use at the time, it was vitally important. When bulk tankers delivered oil to the refinery, it was offloaded at berth 5. From there, the oil travelled 55 feet straight down and approximately 1,200 feet through a horizontal section of pipe, after which it was pumped into the refinery at berth 6. Since the riser at berth 6 was submerged, an 8 foot by 8 foot steel habitat structure had to be installed to give the men a safe and water free environment in which to work. Before the divers entered the habitat, a compressor would create positive pressure which pushed out the seawater and replaced it with fresh breathable air. Once the work environment was ready, the men swam under the habitat's lip, entered the pressurised compartment, removed their diving gear and got to work. One of the first orders of business was removing a large inflatable plug that had been installed a few weeks earlier to prevent more than 1200 gallons of oil from leaking into the sea. But in reality, there was far less oil in the pipeline than anyone had originally thought. When one of the divers loosened the plug, the positive pressure inside the habitat pushed the oil down the pipe. Fractions of a second later, seawater rushed into the chamber, a vortex formed over the riser, and the men and their gear were sucked down into the pipe. This happened so quickly and forcefully that they passed through the vertical pipe, went around the 90 degree bend and traveled another 120 feet into the horizontal portion of the pipe before coming to an abrupt halt. The men were now stuck in the pipe, but luckily there were air pockets at the top of the pipe. This was a godsend because it allowed them to breathe, but the men were terrified, disorientated, and trapped in an unimaginably cramped space. To make matters worse, it was pitch black and they were partially submerged in a slurry of oil and seawater. Now in the darkness, the GoPro recorded remarkably clear audio of them shouting back and forth as they tried to get their bearings and figure out what just happened. One of the men yelled, we're inside the pipe. Then there were groans of pain and anguish and Kazim Ali Jr. told Christopher that his leg was broken. As the designated rescue diver, Christopher took a head count to see who was in the pipe, what injuries they'd sustained, and what order they were in. Christopher determined that he was first in line, and that Kazim, Yusuf, Rishi, and Fizal were behind him. As experienced divers, everyone knew that they couldn't wait around to be rescued, and their best chance of surviving was to get themselves out of the unthinkable predicament they now finded themselves in. This meant they'd have to crawl or swim back to the riser through the pipeline, but they didn't know which direction to go to get back to berth 6. Ultimately, Christopher decided that they'd head in the direction they were facing and hope for the best. To stay together, they linked hands and ankles and began inching forward through the pipe. Along the way, they managed to find just enough air to fill their lungs, but after an hour, the water level began to rise. As they continued on, they could barely hold their mouths and noses in the shrinking air pockets. Eventually, Yusuf, Rishi, and Fazal became too exhausted to go on, so Chris and Kazim decided to break off and continue without them. Before crawling away, they assured the others that they'd do whatever they could to get out and come back with help. Christopher and Kazim got a huge break when they ran into two scuba tanks in the pipeline. They used the remaining oxygen to get through the horizontal portion of the pipe. But by then, air was running out 
and Kazim was having trouble keeping up. Christopher had no choice but to leave him in an air pocket, take the remaining oxygen and keep going. He made better progress by himself, but he was overcome with a horrifying thought when he reached the 90 degree riser bend. If he had gone the wrong way and was at berth 5 instead of berth 6, he'd be blocked in by another inflatable plug. If so, he'd probably run out of air and die just a few feet from safety. Thankfully, he knew he was at berth 6 when he didn't find a plug blocking his path. Christopher screamed and banged against the riser extension with all of his might, and shortly after, a fellow diver named Ronald Ramatar pulled him out with a chain. Christopher took his first gulp of fresh air at approximately 5pm, nearly three hours after he and the other divers had been sucked into the pipeline. Before being rushed to hospital, he told Ronald and a number of Paria employees that the men were still alive and had some air left, but that they wouldn't be able to hold out for very long. But for unknown reasons, rescue divers didn't enter the water until 10pm that night. When they did, they immediately descended down the horizontal section of the pipe and began tapping on it with metal tools. Miraculously, they instantly got a distinct response from the men trapped inside. It's difficult to imagine the release that Kazim, Yusuf, Rishi and Fazal must have felt when they first realised that the divers were just a few feet away. Now all they had to do was wait for the impending rescue, which they probably assumed would commence at any moment. But as the minutes dragged on for what must have seemed like an eternity, nothing happened. Meanwhile, their injuries were becoming more painful, the air pockets were getting smaller and smaller, and at some point, they must have realised that no one was coming for them. As soon as the divers' families found out about the accident, they gathered outside the Paria facility and made it clear that they weren't going anywhere until their loved ones were rescued. Up until then, communication with Paria officials had been spotty. The families were becoming increasingly frustrated with the lack of concrete information whilst lives hung in the balance. The following day at 3pm, a Paria spokesperson let them know that the event had triggered the company's incident management protocols, but this did little to quell their growing anguish. Nearly 24 hours after the incident, they still weren't sure if their loved ones were alive or dead, or what the company was doing to resolve the situation. In fact, many suspected that no rescue operations were underway, and that the company were bidding its time until it could figure out how to protect itself from the bad PR as well as legal and regulatory action. Later, Prime Minister Dr Keith Rowley offered the families his condolences and promised that there'd be a thorough investigation. Likewise, Trinidad and Tobago's Energy Minister Stuart Young visited the site and was brought up to speed on the situation. Then on Sunday the 27th, two days after the accident, Paria representatives revealed that a number of experienced commercial divers and the Trinidad and Tobago Coast Guard had been consulted to see what could be done. Everyone agreed that a rescue operation would put additional divers' lives at serious risk, with very little chance of success. In the end, no rescue attempt was ever carried out and Paria asked the Coast Guard to take control of the site to prevent concerned citizens and family members from trying to rescue the men themselves. As the families clung to a remaining shred of hope, Paria Chairman Newman George said that all four men were presumed dead and that their bodies would be recovered as soon as possible. The men's family may have been able to accept the news if a rescue had at least been attempted, but the fact that their loved ones were left to die was too much to bear. Paria representatives were unsympathetic, but they reminded everyone that multiple experts in the country's Coast Guard had determined that a rescue attempt may have resulted in more deaths. On February the 28th, Energy Minister Young confirmed that an independent panel of inquiry would be created to find out what caused the incident, why there was such a long delay in responding, and what safety measures had been in place at the time. The panel was to be made up by a legal advisor, a subsea safety expert, one representative each from Shell and British Petroleum, and a member of the Energy Chamber of Trinidad and Tobago. The families immediately questioned the committee's composition on the grounds that most of its members were industry insiders with glaring conflicts of interest and loyalty issues. Later that evening at approximately 7pm, the bodies of Fizal, Kazim and Yusuf were recovered. Rishi was still in the pipe, but a company spokesperson confirmed that they were doing everything that they could to retrieve his body. A few days later, on March the 2nd, leaked photos of the bodies went viral. Meanwhile, the victims' families and local supporters held vigils outside the homes of Paria executives 
and called for their immediate resignations. The body of Rishi was recovered just after midnight the following day. Afterward, all pipeline operations were suspended pending the outcome of the investigation and an attorney representing the victim's families announced a legal action had been initiated against Paria. The first hearing wasn't actually held until November the 21st after the audio recordings of the men's in the pipeline were released to the public. Initially, the panel found that only two of the four divers had commercial diving certifications and that there was a number of unknowns in regards to the pipeline's layout and how much oil was inside at the time of the accident. Perhaps most damning of all, Christopher Boudram's testimony revealed that Paria officials and the Coast Guard refused to authorise a rescue operation. Sadly, autopsies revealed that each man had lived until at least Saturday and perhaps even a few days later. Paria Terminal Operations Manager Colin Piper took much of the heat for the company's inaction, but he maintained that he'd made the right decision by not risking more lives to rescue the men trapped inside. He also reiterated that he begged for an immediate rescue operation, but that Paria officials said it was out of the question because the pipeline was blocked and they didn't have proper gear. By now, Christopher's heartbreaking testimony has been seen by millions of viewers around the world. However, it wasn't delivered until nearly nine months into the inquiry. The panel's findings were originally scheduled to be released in August of 2023, but the date has been since pushed back to give those portrayed in a negative light the opportunity to tell their side of the story and provide supporting evidence. Sadly, sole survivor Christopher Boudram has been trapped in a downward spiral ever since the accident took the lives of his friends and co-workers. These days, he suffers from vivid flashbacks and horrible nightmares, and no matter how hard he tries, he just can't bring himself to venture back into the water, even to teach his young daughter how to swim, which is heartbreaking. I hope he manages to find peace and he manages to find justice in this case. Let me know what you think about this case in the comments below. This is not an AI channel, I do all of this myself, the research, writing, editing, thumbnails, etc. And I upload every Thursday. So if you enjoy my work, make sure to leave a like and subscribe for more content and I will see you in the next video. Thank you.